one? I haven't seen anything in the bulletin. I guess not. All right, let me read. Let me do that. First reading comes from Samuel. Um, and we, we, uh, we heard about Samuel a couple weeks ago when Mary was, uh, was singing her song. Uh, she used the song of Samuel's mother. Well, Samuel's been born now. We're gonna, this is the second chapter of Samuel. So Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, may the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift she's made to the Lord. Then they would return to their home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow, both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Our Psalm today, Psalm uh, 148, we'll read it responsibly. We'll start with the little uh, uh, refrain uh, at the beginning. Let me get my version that's got that printed in here, I think. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all you angels. Sing praise to all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise, sing praise, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven and heaven, and the waters of heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded and they were created. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters in all deeps. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the world. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The splendor of the Lord is over earth and heaven. Second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Uh, in our first reading, we heard how, how Samuel's mom would come every year and make a robe for him and bring it to him. Uh, kids do that. They keep growing out of stuff, and you've got to do that. Um, so every year she'd come and reclothe him. Our, our message from our letter from uh, Colossians is Paul talking about being, being clothed, um, and, but not, not necessarily with a new robe every year, but being clothed with other things as well. So from Colossians, we hear these words. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility and meekness and patience. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish each other with, in all wisdom. With gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Friends are reading. All right, I had a children's sermon. We don't really have many kids here, so I think we're just going to zoom past that. Um, so a couple weeks ago, we had the uh, story of the angel coming to Mary with the news she was going to be the mother of Jesus. And, of course, Mary breaks into song. It's Luke, right? So she breaks into song, 
heavily sampled from Hannah, all right? This, uh, this mother who a thousand years earlier, when, when she got news of a miraculous birth that Samuel would be born to her, sings this song. Mary borrows most of it for her song. Uh, and, and so we have this story, uh, the song in our scripture. Well, Hannah gives birth, as we, as we heard a few minutes ago, to Samuel. She dedicates him to serve God. That was our, that was our reading we heard, which also gets echoed. Uh, we come back to this Hannah story and Samuel story with the story of Mary and Jesus. Because Mary and Joseph now, they come and they bring their son, miraculously born, to, to serve God. So we're going to pick up the story, a couple of verses where we left off on Christmas Eve. So it's not the reading we have in here, because they skip a good part. So we're going to, go, we're going to pick up where we left off on Christmas Eve. Um, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male should be designated holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves for two young pigeons. All right, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Um, unlike Hannah, they don't leave Jesus in the temple. Hannah, when they brought Samuel, they said, uh, the firstborn belongs to God. Here he is. I'll be, I'll be back once a year with a change of clothes. Uh, and gave, gave their son to the priest in the temple. They said, firstborn belongs to God. Uh, it was a miraculous birth. You blessed us. And so every year when they would come to give him the new set of clothes, um, uh, the priest would bless them and say, may you have many children because you were willing to give your first one, your first one to God. All right. But unlike Hannah, Mary and Joseph don't leave Jesus at the temple. They, cut, they take him home because there was a loophole, right? Uh, uh, if you made a sacrifice, you could have the sacrifice take the place of your firstborn son. Sort of like the Passover story. Instead of the firstborn dying, you could make a sacrifice which took the place of the firstborn son. So Mary and Joseph, they come, they said, no, we're, we're going to redeem our son. We're going to make the sacrifice so we don't have to leave our baby here. We'll make a sacrifice so we can take our baby home um, and, and, and do that. Uh, but as they're going, they have this, um, these witnesses of, 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 of Simeon and, and Anna, and they say, you may, be, you may be taking your son home, but he's not yours, <laughs> right? God is going to use him mightily to redeem all of us. So, it says, when they finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their town of Nazareth, and the child grew became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now the reading we're supposed to be reading today starts now, after that little section, but we, it's hard to tell the story without an important piece in there. So we pick up now, Jesus is now 12 years old. And you say, well, wait a second, it's only the third day of Christmas, and we've already abandoned the manger? I mean, the tree is still up. Uh, indeed we have, and here's the deal. Christmas is not ultimately about the details of Jesus being born. We, we focus on that. It's huge amounts of time and energy all focused on the details of Jesus being born, but that's not really what the Christmas story is about. This Christmas story is about the incarnation, that God becomes human being. God becomes one of us. God somehow shares our experience. That, because, that is the miracle of Christmas, not that there was some shepherds and a manger somewhere. Now, the, the, the story that Luke's getting ready to tell us now is the only story we have in the Bible of Jesus during his growing up years. None of the other gospel writers mention anything until Jesus is an adult and becomes, uh, begins his ministry. Not that, not that a 12-year-old at that time was, was, uh, was it really a child anymore. You have to remember back then, they didn't have teenagers. There was no such thing as teenagers when Jesus was born. That's a re really a fairly modern construct. By the time you were 12 back then, you were already apprenticed out, you were learning your craft, you were already adult, you were expected to help lead the household. They didn't have such a thing as an adolescent period. You went from childhood right into adulthood. And by 12 years old, you had already made, you had already made that jump. Mary was probably about that age when she had Jesus. 
All right, you were already moved from childhood into adulthood by that time. There were no teenagers. So anyway, Luke chapter 2, I'm going to start with verse 41. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And when Jesus was 12 years old, they went up as usual. When the festival had ended, they started to return, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. Assuming he was with the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. And after three days, they found him. He was in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. And he went down with them and came to Jerusalem and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years in divine and human favor. Those of us who are our parents probably can relate to this story. We never stop worrying about our kids, even when they're, even when they're grown up. Um, but the story of Jesus as a boy, this misunderstanding with the parents, is certainly a story of incarnation. This is real human kind of stuff that happens. As I mentioned, part of the incarnation means that Jesus knows our experience, what Christmas is all about. We don't usually think about Jesus having to grow up to learn about God, to learn about life, having joys and disappointments, getting a sprained ankle or getting a sliver in his finger or living with a family and having parents and siblings and relatives and pets and going to school and being with friends and trying to figure out girls and attending funerals of family members and going to wedding dances. All all the stuff was part of life was Jesus had to figure all that kind of stuff out as a young boy life was different back then but in many some things are are universal life is going to have ups and downs it's going to have good times and hard times and Jesus experienced that he knows that full well from experiencing it Christmas is about God knowing us in a way that you know by doing it, not just by reading about it, right? Sharing our life fully so we may share in God's life. It changes how we think about God, how we think about each other. Once was a village. Um, and people in this village were like most people. They're good, bad, all mixed, all mixed together. Most of them um, found that life was hard. They just needed to try to get through the day and then start it all over again. That's what life is like for a lot of people, right? Maybe even for you. Sometimes just, I need to get through this day and then tomorrow get up and do it all over again. Well, it affected everyone in the village. The leaders knew that this was not, just not a way to live. And so they said, we need to send someone to the, the wise hermit who lives by himself, and he's got great wisdom. Let's send someone to go uh, get a word from him. So they sent someone to the hermit. Hermit listens to their, their situation, is quiet for a very long time, and simply then says one phrase. He says, God is among you. And he leaves. The man's perplexed. I mean, what does that mean? God is among us. But he said, all right, so my job was to listen to the hermit, take it back, share it with the village. And they all pondered, what does this mean? God is among us. Had God actually come and taken human form? What if God was doing that? What if God was actually walking among them? If God was there in the market or at work or with them as they gathered with, with friends? I mean, there's no way of knowing which one of them was God among us. So to be safe, they started treating everybody with a little bit more kindness. 
a little more understanding. Everyone was just a little bit more generous because this might be God. And slowly things began to change. Life is still hard, but people had this sense that they were not alone because God was among them. Sure enough, sometimes they, they, would, they would be there for each other. And it uh, wasn't just one person. Uh, lots of people were there for each other. If they saw someone in need, they realized this could be God who was in need. For a while, they, they speculated, who might it be that was really God? Especially, they were especially attentive if strangers came by. But pretty soon, they, they quit trying to figure out who might be God and treated everyone as if God was there. That's not a bad way to live. Um, later this week, we're going to be replacing our calendars. I don't know if you've got a calendar yet. 2016 is here. I'm not sure what this new year is going to hold. Um, some, some of us have high hopes. Some of us have fears as we, as we look ahead what the future might hold. And that's part of the future. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, but because of the incarnation, we know that we don't do this alone because God is among us, celebrating our joys, comforting us in our sorrows, surrounding us with brothers and sisters in the flesh to remind us God is among us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this miracle of the Incarnation, that you know what it's like. You've walked in our shoes. Help us, Lord, to treat each other as we would treat you, to see you and our brothers and sisters. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.